Hey everyone, and welcome to another episode of Divi Nation. Divi Nation, of course, is a podcast and YouTube show by Elegant Themes, a leader in the premium WordPress theme and plugin market. I'm your host, Nathan B. Weller. Our topic this episode is how to build an effective personal brand. To help us explore this topic, I'll be joined by guest host Phil Simon. Phil is a frequent keynote speaker and recognized technology authority. He's an award-winning author of seven management books that don't suck. Most recently, Message Not Received, Why Business Communication is Broken and How to Fix It. He also consults organizations on matters related to communications, strategy, data, and technology. His contributions have been featured on the Harvard Business Review, CNN, Wired, NBC, CNBC, Inc. Magazine, Business Week, Huffington Post, Quartz, The New York Times, Fox News, and many other sites. Phil, welcome to Divi Nation. Hey, Nathan. How are you? Pretty good. How are you? Good. Thank you for having me. I'm looking forward to this. Me too. Me too. Now, normally, at this point in the show, I say something like, how's the weather? What's going on in your world? But I know you, Phil, are a connoisseur of fine pop culture. And so my question for you today, are you watching any good TV shows? Yeah, I'm waiting for the second season of Better Call Saul. But in the meantime, um, there are a couple of FX shows that are pretty funny. Married in You're the Worst. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. My, uh, I think I've seen one or two episodes of You're the Worst, but I tend to not you know, follow as much um, network television. The only network television show that I'm really into right now is Mr. Robot. Have you seen any of that? I have, and um, I don't want to ruin it for anyone. I think it's an interesting premise, and I'm not the biggest Christian Slater fan, so fortunately mm-hmm. they kind of keep him uh, <laughs> minimized. But yeah, they just concluded season one, right? Yeah, and I have not seen the final episode because they had a delay on it, and so I had to like hold off on seeing that, but, um, but I'm really looking forward to that. My other shows are Game of Thrones, okay, which I'm waiting on that. Um, the Late Show with Stephen Colbert, which just... Just I just saw the premiere with Clooney. That was very funny. I loved uh, Colbert's line. Um, Tonight's show is going to be really good. If you, as long as you give me nine months to prepare for yeah. something, I can do a solid <laughs> yeah, hour. Yeah, he's like, I can do a solid hour television <laughs> if I have nine months every time. Um, and then there are a couple sort of less mainstream shows that I just got into. Blunt Talk, have you heard about that? Mm, that, no. is a, that is a, um, a show by the guy who created Bored to Death. Um, on okay. HBO, and it's got Patrick Stewart in it playing a really absurd, deranged news anchor. It's such a fascinating time. We really are, as many people said, living in a golden age of television. There are so many good shows and so many ways to watch them. I'm old enough to remember when you'd have to sit in front of a TV, and now very few people, it seems like, uh, do that. And with Cutting the Cord and Netflix and Hulu and iTunes mm-hmm. and Amazon Prime, um, yeah, word of mouth has never been more important because I hadn't heard of some of those shows, but I'm definitely going to check them out. So we got some pop culture fix in. You ready to dive into our show today? Rock and roll. So the goal today is for us to talk about how to build an effective personal brand. Obviously, you'll be sharing from your personal experience as someone whose entire business is based off of your own effective personal brand. However, I thought it might be good to begin by getting some context on your life and finding out what it was like before you became Phil Simon, author, speaker, consultant, etc. General Uh, troublemaker. Yeah. So is that that cool if we start there? Yeah, let's do it. Perfect. All right. So I noticed that uh, in my research that you went to Carnegie Mellon University where you studied economics and political science. I might be wrong, but that doesn't exactly scream tech specialist to me. Um, So I'm wondering, you know, I'd really like to connect those two dots. My first question is, at that stage in your life, what drew you to those subjects and and what did you want to be at that point? Hmm. I didn't know what I wanted to be. I needed to go to a good school. It's what my Mm -hmm. parents told me when I was 17, and that's why I went to Carnegie Mellon. Um, I was always pretty good at math and, in hindsight, analysis, uh, the quantitative side of things, maybe not as good at the um, people side of things. And um, I figured I'd figure it out when I went to college, but I changed majors a bunch of times (laughs) and then um, wound up graduating and not knowing what I wanted to do. I kind of envied my friends who knew from age five that they wanted to be attorneys, and Mm -hmm. 35 years later, they're, they're attorneys. Um, I have had to figure it out and go with a very kind of intuitive path. If something didn't feel right to me, then I'd move away from it 
and towards something that I liked, but I didn't know what that something was. And I think that I've kind of figured it out at this point in my life, but I reserve the right to change my mind. Uh, at what any What were point some in the of those future. changes that you made uh, in in college specifically? You said you you changed your major a couple times. So you made some some yeah, changes. change majors, change schools. I um I graduated from Carnegie Mellon, but I spent nine months studying in Washington D.C. Um, I did a semester at the American University, and I did a summer at Georgetown. I thought that I wanted to work for the government, doing something along the lines of policy analysis and economics. But I think that I. My senior year went on an interview for a government position, and just the vibe that I got was so antithetical to my, <laughs> my very being, because I'm about action and technology, and then I got the sense that it was very dated and things were very bureaucratic. And even back then, that just didn't jibe with me, and it certainly mm -hmm. doesn't today. So I, again, I, uh, I guess I'd sum up my early years as a big old process of elimination. Right. It's, was getting your master's part of that? Like, did you get your master's as, as like maybe a pursuit of that government job and then realize, OK, maybe that's not what I want? Or is that something you did later on? No, by that point, I thought that I could work in human resources because I still think to this day that people are the most important asset of an organization. Yeah, data is important and technology, strategy, innovation, all that stuff. But particularly today, because of cloud computing and a bunch of other trends I write about in some of my books, it's very tough to maintain an advantage with technology you know, because mm. of cloud computing, say Amazon Web Services or one of the other competitors. You, know, you can start a company for a fraction of what it would cost you know, 15 years ago, but you can't clone people yet. Right. Um, yeah. Maybe they'll <laughs> wind up doing that. Fortunately, when I graduated from Cornell with my master's in labor relations, it took me all about two or three months to realize that I didn't like working in HR. <laughs> and then I gravitated towards um, technology and implementing um, human resource and payroll systems and, okay. and getting into consulting. Can you kind of describe what that was like going from human resources to consulting to technology? Yeah, I'd argue that they were all kind of part of the same thing. One oh, okay. of, I, I learned early on that as a consultant, one of my greatest assets could be the ability to explain technical things to non-technical people. Mm. If you're talking with a database administrator about some routine that you set up that moves data all over the place, then you have to be very technical. If you're just vague, you're going to annoy that person. Conversely, if you're sitting down with a benefits clerk and you're using a bunch of terms that he or she doesn't understand, then you're confusing that person and making them intentionally or not feel less than intelligent. So I refined over my career my skills and hopefully got to the point at which I could figure out who needed what level of detail. You know, a CEO probably doesn't want a 15-minute explanation of why something is working or not. Just give me the bottom line. Um, but there is a lot of value in being able to speak both languages. You know, there are many um, stereotypes out there, say, from a movie like Office Space, of technical people who just don't <laughs> quite fit in. And I'm thinking of Milton, the squirrely mm -hmm. guy with, this, with the red stapler. Um, so, um, you know, I got better at it over time. Um, consulting is um, in a way very challenging because it's always your fault and you're <laughs> traveling three or four days a week to go to some place and work really long hours and then how would you could you possibly know that something happened 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, so it is a very political environment and I found that there were three types of companies in the world. Those that got it, loved working with those people. Those that didn't get it but wanted to get it, those people were great as well. But then there were those that didn't get it and didn't want to get it. And I tried to avoid that third group because it would never end well. Yeah. Unfortunately, when you're working for a company and they tell you to get on a plane, you can't say, well, this isn't a good fit. I don't have the right skills or experience. You just do as you're told. That's why you collect a paycheck. Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons I went on my own is that I wanted the ability to make some of those calls myself. If I saw red flags on a consulting project, for example, they wanted to do six months worth of work in six weeks, I could pass without getting fired. Right. <laughs> right. Um, I may not know where the next opportunity was coming from, and that's one of the challenges of working on your own. But I suppose that I embrace risk maybe more than some people do. I think that mm. there's risk even working for a big, stable company. They could wake up tomorrow and decide to let you go. So at least right. would you work on yourself by your on your own, you know your own financials, you know how things are going. Hopefully no one's lying to you uh, and you're not lying to yourself. So I've tried to be honest with myself over my career about what I was good at doing, what I was not good at doing, 
and eventually in 2002 just hung my own shingle and did independent consulting before I started writing and speaking. Right. So that's, I think, a really good transition point into our, our main topic today, which is um, how to build your, your own effective personal brand. In my research, I identified three elements of an effective personal brand, all of which, by the way, I think that you've done exceedingly well in. And those three things are authority, persona, and perception. And I'll explain those. Uh, you've established yourself as an authority at the intersection of business management and technology. You've created a fitting and relatable persona that comes across through your website and your books and your talks. And your audience and customers perceive you to be exactly what your persona and credentials are proclaiming you to be. Is there anything else that you would add to that assessment of elements that are like essential to having a personal brand? No, I think you hit the nail on the head. Uh, I think you did your research well, and I, I can't say that I was intentionally doing those things, but now that you explain your framework to me, I can say, yeah, I, I think I've, I've done that. Uh, again, it hasn't always been linear right. uh, at certain points, as, I, as we talked about the other day. Um, if you go on my website under the About page, you'll see a site history, yes. and you'll see fairly ugly websites that didn't exactly <laughs> confer uh, expertise. If you're so smart about technology, then mm -hmm. why does your website suck? Right. But I like to think that my website doesn't suck today, although it is fun to go down memory lane. And um, if you go to the Internet Archive, even if you look at sites like ESPN today, you know, compared to 10 years ago, they look totally dated. But yeah, I, I'd say that those three things I, I wound up doing without necessarily being cognizant of that. Well, with the clarity of, of being able to look back on things um, and the ability to break it up, uh, let's talk some authority. Let's talk about establishing authority. Uh, by 2008, you were writing your first book, Why Systems Fail, which seemed to be a big success, um, and you've written six more since. What led you to write that first book? Um, and was establishing authority on your mind when you did it, or did you do it for another reason? Um, I'd say establishing authority might have been a second or, or third reason. Um, the first reason was avoiding therapy. <laughs> I had worked for <laughs> six or seven years at the point um, on different IT projects, and Everywhere I went, it could be a 100-person company, it could be a 100,000-person company, it seemed like the projects weren't going very well. They weren't conceived very well, a lot of internal politics, and I just thought to myself, I'm either the most unlucky person in the world, or there's something fundamentally wrong with the process of implementing new enterprise systems. Mm. And in 2008, I just started writing and published the book in 2009. My timing could not have been worse. I had a book about new <laughs> IT projects come out in the middle of the worst recession in American history. Right, when everybody's like, no new systems, no big expenses. <laughs> right, and the book did very little despite hiring a PR firm and busting my ass marketing it until in July of 2009, I got a review on Slashdot, and I thought, oh cool, the guy liked the book. And next thing you know, I'm number 91 on Amazon, not for technology books, not for management books, 91. Oh, wow. and that, week I sold maybe 650 books and I realized that it was a lot like uh, another pop culture reference here Pearl Jam's first album to enjoy it while it lasts because it's never <laughs> going to get any better than this ever right it's very unlikely that you'll have this kind of success but because the book did well and I proved that I could sell books then I started to gain interest from traditional publishers and quickly sold the rights to the first book I'd, I'd self-published it uh, and then I signed a contract to do m my second book and have banged out another um, six books since the first mm. one came out. So I, I think that it did um, help with my authority, but I was also curious to see if I could do it. I had a couple of friends who had written books, some very successfully, and it isn't a competition, but when someone you know has published books and been on television and had some level of success beyond just working in a small organization, um, it demystifies it, right? Mm -hmm. They say, wait a minute. That guy was on TV. I used to hold his head over the toilet in college. <laughs> um, it doesn't mean that anybody can do it. It just means that you know someone who has, mm -hmm. and why not give it a shot? Again, I don't consider it to be a competitive thing, but it makes it more real in a way. Sure, it's yeah. not some mystic figure who's only on television or is speaking in front of 20,000 people. It's someone you hang out and play basketball with. Absolutely. So the practice of actually like crystallizing your thoughts on a given subject into books has that been a practice that's been good for you in other ways besides just establishing authority? Has it helped you in your speaking or in your you know, writing on your blog or just in your consulting in general? Oh, sure. There's a great quote. I forget the author, but it's something like, how do I know 
what I think unless I write it down. Yeah, and I love this. I think notion. that's Flannery O'Connor. I might be wrong though. Uh, yeah, we should look. We should put that in the notes for the show. Yeah. So um, I, I like to say that writing gets easier over time. It's a muscle that you have to work. And uh, I think it was Picasso who said, "Inspiration exists, but it has to find us working." Uh, this notion that you're going to just sit there and everything comes to you mm -hmm. is this eureka or aha moment is is pretty much, as my friend Scott Birkin writes, a myth of of innovation. Um, I like to take steps away. There's a great book by um, oh, what's his name? Um, Frank Partnoy called Wait, and mm -hmm. he talks about how if we take someone to the doctor in an emergency. We want that doctor to do something, yet sometimes the best thing for the doctor to do is to take a step back and ask questions. And he mm. jokingly remarks in the book, we really ought to say to doctors, don't just do something, stand there. <laughs> um, and I know that I've had certain epiphanies um, while working on a book or on a talk when I was away from the computer. Um, sometimes you need to take that break. I can remember in November of 2008, I was on the treadmill back when I lived in New Jersey at my gym. And I had this realization that, here's another pop culture reference, that what I did on a project was analogous to what Winston Wolfe, Harvey Keitel's character in Pulp Fiction, did. He would come in to solve problems, and John Travolta <laughs> would get annoyed with him and say, you know, can you say, you know, say please, I don't like being barked at. But sometimes the project was three months overdue and a million dollars over budget, and if I came across as a little bit curt, I'd say, I apologize for that, but time is a factor. I don't have time to gather consensus. We just need to bang this stuff out. Mm -hmm. So um, I think that you can many times take a step back from something, and a lot of the research has borne this out, and then the pieces can come together. Um, sometimes the worst thing you can do if something isn't working, putting together a talk or a blog post or a book or whatever, um, is to keep focusing on it. Sometimes you need to take a step back and go for a run or yeah. watch a movie or whatever. And that's one of the reasons that I try to have either my phone with me or a piece of paper. Um, that way I can jot things down. Uh, Neil Peart, the drummer of Rush, my favorite band, has written a bunch of books. And he has said um, there, there are two keys to writing. One is get it down before it gets away. I love that. And the second is get it down before you get it right. Mm -hmm. Many people suffer from writing by trying to craft the perfect sentence. But, and I promise this isn't the last quote, Voltaire said, perfect is the enemy of good. Mm -hmm. um, you're going to need time to tweak it, whether it's a website or a book or a product or a company's business plan. It's very unlikely that version one will be as good as version five. Very well said. Um, I'm interested in the speaking element of what you do as well. When did that start? After a long time. I um, had spoken in grad school as a teaching assistant. I had tutored. Um, I had done some training as a software consultant and in my HR days doing sexual harassment, basically teaching people how to get away with it. That's a joke. <laughs> but um, it took me four books to start keynote speaking. Again, my books had come out at a time when the economy wasn't great. And there's this notion that if you write a book, then you can be a public speaker. And to be sure, sometimes that happens. But something like 400,000 books come out every year from traditional publishers, never mind the self-published ones. I can promise you that in this country, um, there are not 400,000 keynote speakers. Um, it is very difficult to get somebody to pay you to speak. I have this theory of work. At the bottom is consulting. If I hire you, Nathan, to help my company tell a story, I don't expect you to do it for free. Mm -hmm. At the next rung, it's paid writing. And sometimes people will say, you should write for us for the exposure. And if you're Huffington Post or Wired or the Harvard Business Review, you can make that argument, right? Mm -hmm. But it's not difficult to ascertain how much traffic a website gets, how many backlinks, right? Alexa, Google, PageRank, whatever. And sometimes you say, well, my site gets more traffic than yours. Why am I giving you five free posts, 500 words each? The final rung of the ladder is paid speaking. Um, it's very difficult to get a conference to pay for a proper speaker. Um, eventually, though, I was able to break through it. That doesn't mean that if I get on the Charlie Rose show, I'm going to send him a bill. That exposure argument still applies. Sure. When I was on CNBC through my PR firm, the last thing I was going to do was to, to ask them for money mm -hmm. because it was good exposure for me. And for something like this, I'm not sending you a bill either, so don't worry <laughs> about it. 
But um, it's extremely difficult to get there, but I am stubborn, and I think that once you've written a number of books, if you've got that strong brand, that web mm -hmm. presence, you still have to get out there to market yourself, but to some extent, if they find out about your book or your, your Twitter profile or your website or whatever, and you come across as someone who is professional, then you've adjusted their expectations, right? You've, you've anchored them with this notion that they're going to have to pay for you. Mm. And if your website, quite frankly, sucks and your books don't look very good and you just don't come across as professional, I think that it's more likely that they will say, well, maybe we'll let you speak for free, kind of, sort of, versus, oh, this is an A-level speaker. It, it doesn't guarantee anything. I don't get every speaking gig that I'm in contention for, but I like to think that my brand is one of honesty and intelligence and professionalism, and hopefully people understand that that comes with a price. Sure. Um, I try to customize my talks. It's not just boilerplate. Um, one of my biggest pet peeves is the traditional speaker line. I was thinking about what I was going to say last night. No, 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 no. no. <laughs> you should know exactly what you're going to talk about because you've had that conversation or conversations uh, with your client or your sponsor or conference organizer beforehand. So uh, I encourage people to try and speak, but it is really hard to make a living at it. It helps to be stubborn. Yeah, that was going to be my next question is what, what are some general tips or maybe the process of booking some of those first gigs for someone looking to break in? I'll address the process first. You have to be really patient. Just because you announce yourself as a public speaker doesn't mean you, know, you have built it, they will come. Mm -hmm. And I see a lot of people's websites that say so-and-so is a dyna dynamic public speaker, but then I don't see a single video. And I say to myself, well, that means that either you don't do a lot of public speaking or you don't have a good video. Either way, all else being equal, speaker A, no video, no professional brand or presence. Speaker B has those things. All else equal, I'm going to have that conversation with speaker B. Now, to be fair, many conferences won't necessarily record you. I can remember one of my first keynotes in 2011 in Manhattan at the Red 7 Media Conference. I was speaking about my fourth and most successful book, The Age of the Platform. It's about how Amazon, Apple, Facebook, and Google have essentially redefined business. The night before, I made the mistake of assuming that they would record it. And they said, no, we have no plans to, but you can bring your own video person. So I said to myself, this is a great opportunity. You're speaking in Manhattan in front of 350 people don't give someone in the front row your your iPhone. Right. So I go, I go on Craigslist and I find a video guy in Brooklyn, $300. He shows up, he brings his camera pro, brings the lab, mics me up, and to this day that video is on my website. And I'm not saying that you have to have every video recorded, but you certainly want to give people a sampling of what you can do. If you, mm -hmm. In the past I've worked with speaker bureaus, and if you don't have a sample, particularly of a high quality of yourself in action, then why are they even talking to you? Right. Um, I will spend the money to get the video on my website uh, done through a professional videographer in many cases because I feel like it is good marketing. It does, to your point, reinforce your brand. To me, that's one of the easiest things to do. Don't look at that $300 or whatever you spend as a cost, which by the way, you can write off. It's mm -hmm. a legitimate business expense. Look at it as an investment. And if it gets you one keynote or speaking gig, it pays for itself many times over. Absolutely. And that I think speaks to the, um, or leads into the next segment, which is persona. Cause I really like what you said in one of our previous conversations, which is that, um, your website's the window to the world and alternatively, alternatively the world's window into seeing who you are. What role has that played and how is evolving your website over the years? Um, helped establish your brand? Well, I like to think that it's consistent. Um, if I build myself as someone who knows a thing or two about technology, you know, having a website that looks like Craigslist or, or Seth Godin's site on TypePad isn't consistent with that. Um, it's amazing to me how many times I'll see someone who purports to be an expert on something or a company that does really cool things and their website is slow or it has broken images or it just doesn't look contemporary or it doesn't look good. On a, on a mobile device, which, as you know, with Google's recent um, mobile Geddon update to its algorithm mm -hmm. is increasingly important. So to me, I'm, I'm trying to be consistent and I'm trying to be honest. Um, I have a no bullshit approach to language. You, I've told my friends a few times and even tweeted this, if I ever start talking about uh, customer experience architectures <laughs> and new orchestration platforms to shoot me. And I'm not kidding. Um, so I want to be someone who can take 
complex things and explain them in plain English. Einstein famously said, if you can't explain something simply, then you don't understand it well enough. That ties into my new book and ties into mm -hmm. my personal brand. So I want to be consistent. I don't want to be the type of person who comes across as very um, funny, but when I speak, I'm very stiff. Um, if you go to my website, you'll see plenty of, say, Breaking Bad references. It's my favorite show. I know you're a fan as well. Yes, absolutely. Um, if that bothers you, I don't have to bring up Breaking Bad in every talk, but that's the kind of angle I'm coming at. I, I want to make people laugh. I want to tie in a Seinfeld reference to what's going on with big data. I want to mention how Facebook's new update reminds me of uh, a character on uh, Breaking Bad. And I want that sort of authenticity to come across in person mm -hmm. uh, on my talks or through my books and on my website. So I don't think that the website is necessarily um, an extension of what I'm doing. Um, it's part of what I'm doing. It's very holistic. I, I want my Twitter, my tweets, for example, to be very consistent. Yeah, a lot of them are serious, but some of them are snarky. Mm -hmm. um, I don't just tweet about business things. I may tweet something with the Breaking Bad hashtag or get into it with someone about what's going on in the US Open for tennis or something. Sure. So um, I like to be consistent and authentic and if that doesn't appeal to someone, kind of going back to my theory about three types of people, those that get it, those that don't get it, want to get it, and those that don't get it, never want to get it, I, I don't want to be put in a situation when I'm up on stage or, or in a consulting gig in which people thought they were getting um, Coke and I'm Pepsi. Absolutely. Now, in terms of perception, I did a bit of poking around to see how your audience perceives you online. Oh, God. Uh, <laughs> don't believe it. <laughs> Google is lying to you. I, I think it was really uh, positive stuff. I, I looked at uh, particularly pay attention to your book reviews on Amazon and it seems like everybody, for the most part, uh, really thought that your perception matched the brand that you're projecting. Um, However, in a previous conversation, you mentioned to me that with some of the larger sites that you've written for, uh, there's always going to be some like a troll element or people who just don't agree with you, the ideas or whatever it is that you're trying to talk about. How have you developed any useful methods to respond to these types of situations or individuals? I don't think I'm saying anything original here, Nathan, but um, number one, you try to ignore the trolls. You know, if someone sure. legitimately disagrees with you and, and there's a comment policy on my website with a clickable icon to a very iconic Breaking Bad scene, um, you know, respectfully disagreeing, making another point, um, maybe I'm wrong on something. I, I want that kind of critical discourse on my website. But if the comment is Phil Simon sucks, and then sure. there's a link to insert name of, of spam site, then you know that, that goes away. Sure, so, so what happens when the criticism or critique is, is actually right? What happens when that critique is maybe showing you how uh, what you're projecting is not the perception that everyone in your audience is getting and you wanna align the two? Do you have a way of, of uh, affecting that change? Yeah, I'll give you a specific example. In 2009, when my first book came out, again, I self-published it. I didn't mm -hmm. seek a deal with a traditional publisher because I had never sold a book in my life. And publishing is just a business. Um, it doesn't matter if you've got a great smile, you're a good writer, social media presence. Ultimately, they're saying, how will we know if this person can get our money back? 70% of all books don't earn out. In other words, the advance that the author gets is the only money that that author ever receives. They'll never get any more because they've essentially paid back the publisher. And I can remember one, I believe it was three-star review of my first book that criticized the production as well as the editing on the first edition of Why New Systems Fail. And I thought about it, and at first I go, wow, that's my first bad Amazon review. But the guy was absolutely right. And to that end, I vowed that in the future, if I ever did it myself again, and I've actually run two books subsequently to that through my own publishing company, I hired professional designers, professional editors, cover people. In other words, even though two of my books came out through my own company, they look just as good, if not better, than books that I've done with traditional publishers. Mm. But that costs a lot of money. So uh, that's just one example in which I like to think I listened to legitimate feedback and said, I never want to make that mistake again. I never want one of my books to look like it was done at Kinko's. And sure. I see a lot of self-published books like that. And again, if I were doing it as a side project because I was an IT consultant and I wrote a cookbook, then I wouldn't care as much. But to me, the books are very much an extension of my personal professional brand. And if they don't look professional, then it's very easy for other people to assume that I'm not professional. And I don't want that. 
Absolutely. This isn't a hobby for me. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, it looks like we're running up against our time. Um, it looks like it's time for the parting thought. It's something we do at the end of every episode. I like to ask uh, our guests to leave us with sort of a thought that encapsulates their take on our primary topic. And um, we've covered a lot of ground today. And for someone, I think, who's completely new to the concept of building a personal brand, acting on every single thing that we've talked about may be a little bit overwhelming. Um, so is there one thing or area that you'd recommend people focus on first and foremost when it comes to building an effective personal brand? Yeah, I'd say that it's very important to remember that it is a marathon, not a sprint. And mm -hmm. don't take my word for it. In the talks before this, we were talking about Breaking Bad. And for those of you who don't know, it's a show about a high school chemistry teacher with terminal lung cancer, six months to live and to provide for his family, he starts manufacturing crystal meth. The lead actor of the show is the very gifted um, actor Brian Cranston. And Breaking Bad came to him when he was 51 or 52. And now he's an A-list actor. He's been in a bunch of movies. He starred on Broadway. He has his pick of the litter. But it wasn't always like that. He's done hemorrhoid commercials and soap operas and gone months without working. So this notion that you can decide to be an actor and you're the next Brian Cranston or decide to be a writer and you're the next James Patterson um, may happen, but the odds are against it. You really mm -hmm. do have to be stubborn and play the long game. Just because you wrote a blog post doesn't mean that the world will read it, that people will tweet about it, that it will go viral. I, I read yeah. a stat a few years ago that a blog post was published on WordPress every seven seconds. Yeah, it's some ridiculous number. Yeah. So it's important to have a long term perspective. And you may not be able to make a clean cut if you work as a uh, landscaper and you want to get into something else, you may have to do that as I have over a number of different years. So um, just be careful. Um, sometimes it's, it's, it's easy to get discouraged because you were on Twitter for six months and you have eight followers. Why aren't you viral? Mm -hmm. um, why aren't you trending? Um, these are the types of things that A, take time and B, involve quite a bit of luck. But if you enjoy it, it doesn't feel as much like work. And if you see yourself getting better as a writer, as a speaker, as whatever you do, you see your website improving, you see more backlinks, Twitter followers, views on your website, whatever, then that can be encouraging. It just it does take a lot of time. So that that is my parting thought. Thanks. Very well said. Well, Phil, it's been a pleasure. I really appreciate you coming on Divination. Nathan, thank you so much for your time. So just to recap, in order to build an effective personal brand, there are at least three core areas of focus. One, establishing your authority on a given topic. There are a few ways you can do this. You can do what Phil has done and write books or speak at events and company gatherings. But you could also do things like blog, create videos, or anything that helps you demonstrate a deep understanding of your niche. Two. Crafting and projecting a relevant persona. Your persona is not a fake personality that you adopt because that's what you think people want to see from you. An effective persona is nothing more than an intentional expression of your genuine values. This is communicated through the language that you use, the way that you dress and present yourself, the aesthetic of your web design, and all of the little details that make up how people perceive you. Speaking of which, three, Make sure that the brand your audience is perceiving is actually the brand you're trying to build. If not, you'll want to tweak your approach until the two align. You can make necessary adjustments by not shying away from hard truths about your shortcomings, whether they be in your presentation, approach to work, or even core knowledge. Phil's story is a great example of how one guy has navigated these obstacles and come out on top. I encourage you to go to his website, philsimon.com, which, by the way, was built with Divi, and take notes. Then try to apply these ideas and concepts to your own personal brand. One way you might want to do that is by making some adjustments to your website, which brings us to our final two segments. First up, we've got another Divi quick tip where I'll teach you how to display your logo and menu items at a fixed height instead of having them shrink to a smaller size when you scroll down the page. And second, a Divi plugin highlight segment in which we cover some of the best slider plugins to pair with Divi. All of that coming up right now.
In this Divi quick tip, I'm going to show you how to stop the Divi logo and menu items from shrinking when you scroll down the page. Even though a lot of people like this subtle default setting, many would like these elements to stay the same size at all times. As a result, this is one of the most asked questions in our support forums and on social media. Thankfully, the fix is really simple. First, navigate to your ePanel and make sure that fixed navigation is enabled. Next, go to the Divi customizer then to header and navigation. There are two relevant sections here. The first is called primary menu bar. Click there and make sure that the menu height, logo max height, and text size are all set to the sizes you want them to stay at. Next, head back one menu and select the fixed navigation settings. You'll wanna match the fixed menu height to the menu height you just set in the primary menu settings. The same goes for text size. When that's done, save your settings and test it out on the front end. You should now have a logo and primary menu that remain the same size when you scroll down the page. Well, that's all for this Divi Quick Tip. If you have a Divi question that you'd like turned into a future Divi Quick Tip, you can email it to podcast at elegantthemes.com with the subject line Divi Quick Tip Request. Up next, have you ever wondered which slider plugins are right for your project and play well with Divi? We've got the answers in this edition of Divi Plugin Highlight. Check it out. Wanting more robust slider options to pair with Divi is something that comes up time and again in the forums, blog comments, and on social media. Everyone always wants to know which slider plugins other community members have had success with and what they recommend. That's why in this Divi plugin highlight, I will be highlighting three different slider plugins that play well with Divi. These are all plugins that Divi community members have used and recommended based on previous successes when pairing with Divi. I'll start with the lightweight free slider plugin first and work my way up to the more robust premium options. Divi community members David Blackman and Sam Smith both recommended MetaSlider by Matcha Labs, which is free to download at the official wordpress.org plugin repository. MetaSlider is an extremely popular and well-rated plugin. It's really easy to create and deploy new sliders just about anywhere on your site using shortcodes. Sam Smith was kind enough to share this example of a Divi website on which he used MetaSlider. As you can see, it functions quite well and responsibly as a carousel within this Divi section. So to recap, Meta Slider is free, simple to implement, and responsive. Sounds like a pretty good option to me. Next up, we've got Layer Slider. Layer Slider is a premium plugin that can be found at CodeCanyon.net for $18. It's a robust and versatile slider option with some impressive features, including responsiveness, mobile friendliness, which includes touch sensitivity, a WYSIWYG drag and drop slider builder, over 200 transitions, and a lot more. Divi community member Corey Jenkins submitted this example of the layer slider plugin working with Divi. Looks great to me. Finally, we have another premium plugin from Code Canyon called Slider Revolution. This plugin is easily one of the most popular WordPress slider plugins and works with a great number of WordPress themes, including Divi. Slider Revolution claims to go beyond what most people expect of a slider plugin and instead offers something very web app-like for creating mobile-friendly presentations. Some of its key features include responsiveness, granular control over a ton of slider design features, a no-coding required interface, 30-plus ready-to-use slider types, and a whole lot more. Divi community member Andrew Palmer submitted this example of a Divi website he built using Slider Revolution. It loads fast, looks great, and adds a ton of style to his project. For the price and features you get, this is probably my favorite one of them all, and you can get it for $19 at CodeCanyon.net. But of course, you will have to decide which option is the best fit for both you and your project. That's all for this edition of Divi Plugin Highlight. If you have a plugin that you love to use with Divi, I'd love to hear about it. Email me at podcastelegantthemes.com with the subject line, Divi Plugin Highlight Submission. Also, if you're interested in a closer inspection of the example sites we showed, as well as links to the plugins we just talked about, be sure to check out the video description or the Elegant Themes blog post for Divi Nation Episode 5. 
Hey everyone, I've got a few quick announcements before signing off. I'd like to remind everyone that there is still time to submit your website for the Divi Site Makeover Challenge. If you're not familiar with this competition, all you have to do is send us a link to your website as well as screenshots of your site before and after redesigning with Divi. You can email them to podcast at elegantthemes.com with the subject line Divi Site Makeover Submission. We'll be featuring our favorites on the podcast as well as on the Elegant Themes blog. It's a great way to share your work with the community. We're also looking for more Divi Nation guest hosts. You don't have to volunteer yourself to help us out. You can simply nominate anyone in the Divi or wider WordPress community that you think would make a good guest host, and we'll reach out to them about being on the show. Just leave a comment on this video or in this blog post with the name of your nomination and a few sentences on why you think they'd be a good guest host. We'll take care of the rest. Speaking of future guest hosts, Next week, we've got Gino Quiroz on the show to talk about building a Divi consultancy. A lot of my clients turn to other marketing agencies and IT agencies who've found my stuff, read my stuff, mm -hmm. have used my tutorials, saw my child themes and said, hey, you know what? This guy's qualified enough to be our go-to guy. That's all for now. See you next week.